before you once again, thanking you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to get together this evening to study from thy book, thy book. Let us take thy words and apply them to our everyday walks of life as we go through this life so we may bring others to thee and we may be better Christians. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. We know many times we fall short of thy glory. We ask that you forgive us of these transgressions. And we ask that you be with our teachers in the wing, Father, with our young people. Help them study thy word and be good Christians. Guide, guard, and direct us all. Be with our president of these United States. Be with our leaders. Let them lead in a way that we will always be able to enjoy the freedoms that we now have. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Be with us as we go through this study and the rest of our studies. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to Titus. The Apostle Paul wrote to Titus about the same time he wrote to 1 Timothy. We just finished 1 and 2 Timothy, and a lot of the things that he wrote to Titus were the same kind of things that he wrote to Timothy. These two young men, well, not as young as they were, of course, none of them all, none of us all, but they are responsible individuals that traveled with the Apostle Paul in his what we call missionary journeys. And coincidentally, both of them are in a position where he left them at a place with a mission, with a purpose. And the purpose is spelled out in First and Second Timothy, Book of Timothy, and in the Book of Titus, Book of Titus. It begins with Paul, a servant of God. So Paul identifies himself as the writer and calls himself a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so this is Paul's mission in life and has been for some time, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and being a servant of God according to the faith of God's elect. And I am using the American Standard Version. I've studied this book thoroughly this week, and I almost brought the New American Standard because of the language, but I didn't. And I, I may next week, but I haven't this week yet. The language is a little easier in the New American Standard. But we find Paul identify himself, and he says, according to the faith of God's elect. And as I say, the American Standard is a little bit awkward there. But somebody got a, a, a different reading in that? For the faith of those chosen of God. Okay, for, yeah. for. And that, that is his purpose. Yeah, when, I have a King James. Okay. That is his purpose in life and has been for years and years now. And <clears throat> he's instilled it in these young men as well. And they have taken up his mantle and they are trying to do and are doing a good job of continuing the <laughs> preaching of the faith of God. We talked about the faith. And we understand the words the faith have to do with the whole of the teaching of God. The things that we are required to understand. I'm saying with some people now in emails that can't grasp the idea of it's necessary for people to understand what God wants us to understand before we can serve them. I find that just because I've spent so much time in the Lord's church and that's such a primary thing, it seems so unnecessary to have to instill that in people. But understand
understand this. People have not been taught that in the other churches. And so when you insist that they recognize the fact that they have to understand it's not all up to Jesus. They have a part, and that part, as you well know, is you have to understand what Jesus or what God wants from you. And he's put it in this book. And that's part of the problem that Paul has left Timothy at Crete to take care of. Let's see where he says the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. And we'll pause on godliness again. We, we dealt with godliness a lot in the language to Timothy because it's such an important factor and it's mentioned so many times. Godliness is the character of God that we take upon ourselves. The nature and character of God. How God thinks and how God acts. And for, for years we've been studying the Old Testament because he demonstrates his nature and character so much and so clear in the Old Testament as he deals with the Jews and as, as he deals with the rest of the people. And so that's the nature of godliness. In hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time eternal. The Ephesian writer talks about the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God is the salvation of his greatest creature. Man is made in God's own image. Man is made with a choice. And we make choices every day, and God wants us to make the right choice. That's his eternal purpose. And that will serve as us becoming servants of God, doing God's will, pleasing God, loving God, and being godly in our lives. It talks about God in this respect, who cannot lie. God made promises. He made promises of man to man beginning in the very first when he talked to Adam. He made promises to Abraham, to David, and to many other people in the Old and New Testament. And he's made promises to us. And to reinforce the concept of God's promises being sure he brings up the fact that God can not lie. We have the idea sometimes that God can do anything. God can't lie. God can't lie. We talk about the creation and we talk about God whispering things into existence. Out of nothing. God calls things to be something. And from that we gather the idea that if God says something that wasn't true before he said it, when he said it, it's true. He cannot lie. What God says is reality. It is the truth. And so this reassures the promises from God. God is going to keep his promises. When he promises something, it's going to come about. There's no question about it. He cannot lie. But in his own season, manifested his word in the message. When it talks about his own season, we understand that God has plan, that eternal purpose. And he has not communicated that time 
to man before Jesus Christ came. And there's some things that the time of them, he didn't even include in the knowledge that he gave Jesus Christ or the prophets. From time to time in the Old Testament and in the, in the New Testament, God inspired men to prophesy his will. But there's some things that God alone controls. And the time of the end of the world is one of the magnificent examples of that. Nobody knows. Nobody knows when he's going to die or she's going to die. There's some things we don't know. But it was exactly at the right time, according to God, that he sent Jesus Christ to die for the sins of mankind. And at that time beginning, he's manifested or made known his will for the deliverance of man. <clears throat> But in his own season, manifested his word in the message. And the, the message is kind of like the faith. It is the message from God. And that message contains the will of God as far as mankind is concerned. What he expects from men, what he wants from men, and those that love him, are interested in knowing what that is. And this is the only source of that will today in our time. Wherein I was entrusted, Paul speaking now, and he's speaking to Timothy, and I'm persuaded that Timothy already knows this. After having lived with, traveled with, taught with, and been in the presence of Paul as he taught over these years. Timothy already knows these things, but he's reassuring Timothy of them so Timothy can be and will be as strong as he needs to be to do these things, teach these things. To the commandments of God our Savior. Anybody have any questions? Okay, this is just the introduction. He hasn't gotten into any meat yet, other than trying to reassure Steve, uh, Timothy and or Titus and getting him ready. To Titus, my true child, after the common faith. The word common carries with the idea of something that we share. We share the faith. We understand it alike. And we're required to understand it alike. First Corinthians, first chapter brings this to our attention. We are required to understand it alike. It's one of our obligations to understand it, and when we understand it, we will understand it alike. We have to realize that God wants us, as we've already talked about, to understand his will. And I'm persuaded that you share this thought with me. That God loves us and wants us to do his will. He has the capability to make it, make it understandable. Think of this. If God requires us to understand his will, and we say to one another or to the world, I just can't understand that. I consider that an accusation of, against God that he can't make it understandable or he won't make it understandable and still require you to understand it. Not the God I love. It's understandable. And we need to understand it. <clears throat> and that's the common faith that we share. Grace and peace from God the Father and Je or Christ Jesus our Savior, a salutation, a common salutation that we find in most of the letters by the Apostle Paul to the person that's addressed. He wants him to enjoy the mercy and peace from God the Father. Then he begins to address 
the reason he's writing. For this cause left I thee at Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that were wanting and appoint elders in every city as I gave thee charge. So here we have the Apostle Paul and Titus traveling and I don't know when. I'm just always interested in when. But I don't know when. But they come to Crete and Crete's a big island in the Mediterranean. And it has lots of cities in it, lots of people on it. And we'll talk about those people in just a minute. And Paul's traveling through this island, and he's got to go somewhere else. But he knows there's problems in, in Crete, and he knows there's problems among our brethren in Crete. And so he's going to leave Titus there with these instructions. He's already talked to him in person about it that's what he just said and now he's going to give him some written instructions <clears throat> and sometimes when you think about preacher or teacher giving some people personal vocal instructions you think boy that's good that's good stuff but when you write it down and you have it and Timothy can say, I'm not speaking on my own. See, here, here's the letter from Paul. Here's the letter from Paul. We know Paul's an inspired apostle. And so it carries that authority with it. And that's one of the reasons <clears throat> that these books are here. It's written to Timothy. It's written about Crete. But it's for us as well as it was for those people because we can read the same words that they could read, that Timothy could read, that he could show to these people in Crete. Here's God's will. This is it. <clears throat> the things that are wanting and appoint elders. That's two, <clears throat> two categories of problems that exist that Titus is going to take care of. And we'll talk about each of those when we come to it. But the first one is if any man is blameless. And what man is blameless? Christ. Christ. But he's not here. And he's not there either. And so we're going to talk about appointing elders. And the first thing he tells Titus as if any man is blameless. How are we blameless? Justified. We're justified. We're cleansed. We're cleansed. But there's also another aspect in this. And I'm persuaded he's talking about not just the cleansing of our souls by the forgiveness of God's grace, but also in the public. In the public, you have to have a man that's going to be an elder in the Lord's church, lead the Lord's church, that the public recognizes as a right-thinking and acting man. And I'm persuaded that, that those words are involved in the idea of being blameless. And the next one is like, and many of these are like, just exactly alike, what he told Timothy in 1 Timothy, <clears throat> when he told him to appoint elders at Ephesus. But we'll read over them. He's got to be the husband of one wife. What does that eliminate? A woman being an elder, as far as I'm concerned husband of one wife is pretty specific. I don't know how you could have made it more specific. People that have women leading Lord's <coughs> churches are acting without God's authority. Having children that believe, and so you want him to have control of his household. If he can't call Timothy, or, or he's always Timothy, if a man can't take over his own household, how is he going to take care of the Lord's church? And so forth. They believe in children, we're not accused of right or unruly. There are a lot of people 
that fall into that category of right and, and unruly. But the, the bishops or the elders' church, the elder of the church cannot have children like that. For the bishop, and now we have a different word describing the same office of the same man. He uses the word elder in introduction, and now he's using the word bishop. And I read a commentary that said at the, <clears throat> at the writing of Titus, both of those offices, and he talked like this, both of those offices were the same office. But after the church advanced for a few hundred years, they divided into two offices. And that's true in the churches that exist in the world. They can do anything they want to do. But with those people that are dedicated to doing what God has told them to do, it's the same office. It's the same job. It's the same position. It's the same responsibility. He calls them that in this text for that purpose so that people would recognize that God wants people that can do this job is one job. Two names for the same job. An elder and a bishop. He must be blameless as God's steward. The word steward talks about responsibility. The people that had wealth and property in this day that Paul is writing had stewards that took care of their business. And this person we're talking about appointing as a responsibility of taking care of God's business. And so he calls him a steward, and he says of the steward, he, and these things, he can't be self-willed, not soon to anger, no brawler, no striker, not greedy for filthy lucre, not given to, uh, but given to hospitality, as a lover of good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, hold, holding the faithful word which is according to, to the teaching that he may be able to exhort with sound doctrine. Now I've said a lot. But we can bog down on each one of these characteristics that he must have. But if anybody has any question about any one of them, bring it up and we'll talk about it. But otherwise, oh, go ahead, Rick. Uh, in the New American Standard, in the uh, two or three other translations, verse 7, see the bishop says overseer. That okay. word occurs a number of times in the New Testament. Okay. It's just a different translation. It's the same job, though. Yes. He, said, he is overseeing the work of the church. And not just the work of the church, he is overseeing every member in the church. You may think the things that you do are your business, but there's somebody else's business too. Everything you do in your life reflects upon the Lord's church. And the elders are supposed to help you walk the straight and narrow pathway of righteousness. It's part of your responsibility. It's not just yours. <clears throat> a lover of hospitality, of good, he loves good. That's wonderful, then. Sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding the faithful word which is according to the teaching that he may be able to exhort in the sound doctrine. <clears throat> the fact that the word doctrine has the word sound in front of it is significant. There are a lot of doctrines. <coughs> There's as many doctrines as there is denominations. Each one of them's got their own doctrine, their own creed book, and their own ideas about what God wants done. Sound doctrine signifies the kind of doctrine that we must teach, that we must hold on to. Matthew 15, 9 tells us 
that there is other than sound doctrine. These, this verse and many others told there are false doctrines. Anybody that says Jesus, Jesus, Jesus doesn't necessarily teach a sound doctrine. Well, maybe I'll spend enough time on that. And to convict gainsayers. <clears throat> so he's introduced the idea that not only is teach sound doctrine, but there are other people teaching things that are not sound. This is early in the history of the Lord's church. This is within 30 or 40 years of the beginning of the church. And this is just one of the places, there are many places where the Lord's church, uh, Bible talks about false teachers. At this early stage, there was false teachers, and it's been 2,000 years. Just think of the false doctrines that have come to light in that period of time if they were already in the first 30 years or plus false teachers. The way the New American Standard says it, and to refute those who contradict. And that's part of the job. Right. <clears throat> and I'm not saying it just in the Lord's church, but in the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God, has had an <coughs> influence on the world in the last 2,000 years. It's had a magnificent influence on the world in the last 2,000 years. It's caused people to be more moral, more moral than they were before. They think of things in a different sense than the Romans did or the Greeks did. It's had a great influence on the world. But the purpose of God's word is not the betterment of humanity. The purpose of God's work is the saving of souls. And when people change God's will just a little bit, how much can they change it and it still have the power that God put in? And that's the kind of thing he's talking about here. The gainsayer is teaching Error. And I, I don't know what form it may take. There are lots of different forms it takes today. But the error he's teaching is significant <coughs> enough that it's causing people that think that they're serving God to be destined for eternal punishment because they believe in a lie. And that's the kind of people that the elder has to confront. And especially in the Lord's church. But I'm convinced in the world as well. And convict the gainsayer. The job is not just to teach and to preach and to confront error, but it's to convince. It's not to just fight the battle. But it's to win the battle. His objective is not just to prove I'm right and you're wrong, but to convince you that you have to do it just the way God wants it done. Just exactly what God wants it taught. Back to what we were talking about a while ago about believing the truth. For there are many unruly, vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. The Apostle Paul occupied this position before when he was Saul of Tarsus. So he really knows what he's talking about. It took a miracle to convince him. But we don't have miracles. We have the word. And that's our tool. That's the only tool we have. I know 
Then when the white man came, the Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere, they spread Catholicism with a the sword. They had, the people had, to be Catholics or they were going to die. But our only tool is the Word. And so we've got to know what it says and be prepared, and especially a person that's going to occupy the overseer, the elder, the bishop's position. But these circumcised guys are the Jews, and they're teaching, and they have taught, and we've dealt with it before, that unless a man circumcised, he can't be saved. The Apostle Paul, Marmus, and others went to Jerusalem in the 15th chapter of Acts and fought that battle back then. Do you think everybody understood it? But it's just like any other subject. Not everybody understands it. I know people that have sit in pews like you're sitting in and listen to gospel preachers and teachers of the gospel for years and years and years and never do hear it. Never do hear it. Well, I'm not saying it doesn't fall on the ear, but they don't hear it in the sense that they understand it. We talk and we preach God's truth. And our objective has to be, necessarily has to be, to get the people hearing to understand it. Or we're wasting our time. They have to understand. Come on. <clears throat> one of the things I see in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Titus chapter 1, he makes, makes it known to these young men, there are going to be people that are ignorant that you need to teach. They're going to, because they never heard the truth or they don't understand it, you're going to have to be patient with them. He uses that phrase several times. But in 1 Timothy and Titus 1, he, there's a whole other category. And that is people that are empty talkers, people that are deceptive, that they, they have some motivation for not knowing the truth or not teaching the truth. And it was going to be their job uh, to use the measuring stick of the word to get them right. And some, some of them are like these Jews he's talking about. Judaism has been around a long time. Generation after generation after generation after generation, they talk the same thing. And now all of a sudden somebody's coming along and they're teaching something different. Well, we want to listen to that new stuff. We want to go along with this new stuff, but we can't leave the other behind. And no matter what the other is, whether it's Judaism, whether it's your love for any kind of sin, or what it is, you have to leave it behind. You have to leave it behind. For there are many unruly men, vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. Not with a sword, but with the truth. And truth presented in such a way that you will understand it. You still have a choice, don't you? You still have the choice. A choice. You have to make up your mind to want to understand it, or you never will. The desire of your heart must be to understand it. And open your ears and your heart to the truth. Men that overthrow whole houses, teaching things that they ought not. And he doesn't go into any detail other than with the Jew, Jewish, the circumcision he's talking about. He doesn't go into any detail what these things are. But the list could be gigantic. It could be enormous. And certainly it is today, if you're looking around at the religious world today. It is enormous. You don't know where to start sometimes when you're trying to start teaching people, start teaching people the truth. It's hard sometimes. You have to spend time with them to get to know where you ought to start, isn't that right, Rick? You have to know where to start. 
And some of them are doing things they ought not for filthy lucre. That's ill-gotten gain. And if you look at the TV and you hear the preachers on the TV, you're going to notice quickly that money is a very important thing. And money is an important thing. It's important to the, this church right here. We function in this world with money. The gospel is preached with money. The building is built with money. And we have this electric light with money. So it's important. It's an important factor. But he's talking about ill-gotten gain, and that's got gain that you don't, don't have any real right to. The people preaching the wonderful, happy news on TV that's not the will of God, and they say it is, are interested in your money, anybody's money. And that's the kind of thing he's accusing people of right here. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, and he's talking about the Cretans. I understand the Cretans were a very civilized group of people. And you can understand why. They live on an island, probably a lot of piracy, piracy and other things going on. But they weren't a real uh, civilized type people. One of their own prophets says, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, idle gluttons. <laughs> well, these are terrible things to be calling people, but Paul knows what he's talking about as he quotes one of the group, uh, prophets from this island. Now, and he didn't say false prophet. He said prophet. When we think about prophets, we automatically, it's just a, a trap door, we automatically think about God's prophets. And we think that's the only kind of prophets there were. And in a sense, that's right. But we know from studying the Old Testament that there were at least three prophets among the Gentiles. I, would, I long to know what they taught to what kind of people they approached and what they were trying to achieve with those people. Now, I can't hardly help but fall into the trap of thinking they were trying to get people to live righteous lives. They were God's prophets. Jethro was one. And how Kizadek was another. He wasn't just a prophet. He was a king as well. And Balaam was another one. Balaam had the same problem with some of these people that he's warning Titus about. He loved money. But there are false prophets and this time and they're evil beasts, gluttons. Their testimony, this testimony is true and that's this testimony of this prophet. Was this prophet a prophet of God? He was a, a Christian. But was he a prophet of God? I don't know. The Gentiles had prophets of God. They had servants of God. They had people that did God's will. And most of the Bible, Old Testament, is about the Jews. And sometimes it's about the Jews relative to these other prophets. So their testimony about the evil people is true, and you've got to have the courage, the knowledge, the understanding to withstand them. For which cause reprove them sharply. Don't just ease around. Don't just try to get along. But you've got to reprove them. They've got to be exposed. And it's part of the responsibility of the elder. That they may be sound in the faith, and that's always our objective in all of our, te all of our teaching. All the things we try to accomplish is that people can understand and have the desire, the will, to do God's will. 
Anybody have any questions or comments? And where am I? Not given to the Jewish fables and commandments of men. Matthew 15 and 9 says that some people worship in vain, teaching for commandments the will of men. To the pure, now he's about to conclude the qualifications of the elders. And he's shifting gear just a little bit when he says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Is it about time for us to quit? Just turn it. Okay, we'll, we'll begin right there. 15th verse, how about that? For next week, I appreciate your attention. Looks like I've kept everybody awake today. Anyway. Well, thank you very much for your attention. We'll lead our singing. Uh, Brother Ashley will have the opening prayer. Brother Rick will have the invitation tonight. And uh, Brother Nicky will have the closing prayer. I'll turn it over uh, to Brother Jeffrey. 166. I love you so. <coughs> Why did my Savior come to earth and to the awful goal? Why did he choose a holy birth? Because he loved me so. He
Timothy chapter 4, 
I'm going to look at verses 15 and 16, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I was out two Wednesday nights with my most recent and what I hope to be the last knee surgery I ever had in my life. We had a good song service, and Linda and I were watching that on the computer. And then the week before that, Owen finished up with 2 Timothy chapter 4. There is a principle here that is talked about. I want to come back to it in a minute. But I want you to think about it. It's a very common principle throughout the entire New Testament. I want to give you three examples because this is a five-minute talk. <coughs> Father, forgive them. That occurs in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Anybody know who said that in Luke 23, 34? Jesus Christ. What situation was he in when he uttered these phrases? this phrase? He was on the cross dying. It was spoken by another young man in Acts chapter 60 and verse 7, and he essentially quoted verbatim what Jesus said on the cross. Anybody know who this young person was? Stephen. Stephen. What situation was Stephen in in his life when he uttered these words? Like Jesus Christ, he was moments away, or hours perhaps, but just a very short time away from meeting his maker, we say, from, from leaving this earth. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. This is the last piece of writing that he gave us. A man who wrote half the New Testament, either 13 or 14 of the 27 books. But at the end of his life, he's got things that he wants uh, inscribed in writing that people have been reading about for 2,000 years. I'll give you an example. Verse 14. 2 Timothy 4.14 4, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Now that seems like something a little bit odd, doesn't it? Years ago, I, I used to and still like to watch old westerns. Some of these you know, were done in the 40s, 50s, 60s, but even up into maybe in the 70s. And I can remember an old movie where these two fellas had been fighting over land for years and years and years over property rights and where the fence ought to be. And this one fellow was, was in his, uh, on his deathbed. He's just about to die. And this fellow who had been his enemy for years decided, you're going to come say uh, goodbye to him before he leaves. And they're sitting there talking. And, he, and, uh, and the fellow in bed says, well, if I die, I'll accept your apology. And the fellow said, I didn't apologize. And then he said, but if I get well and get up out of this bed, it's on again. I want you to look at the next two verses. Verse 15, be on the guard for, against him and yourselves, for he vigorously opposes our teaching. Now look at verse 16. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. What does Paul say? Somebody tell me what he says there. They did not be charged against him. Isn't that very similar to Father, forgive them? So the Apostle Paul, at the, at the very end of his life, and I don't know whether he lived a week or a month or six months after this, but he's asking God, very much like Stephen did and like Jesus Christ did, that, that people had done them wrong, and what are they asking for? Don't hold it against them. Now let me tell you what's odd about this. And this... This is something I've thought about a lot over the last 20 or 30 years, and the more I've thought about it, the better it has made me as a person, and the better it makes me sleep at night. <clears throat> is it possible, if Jimmy Dale is living the most ungodly, wicked life, I pray to God and say, Father, please forgive Jimmy Dale. But Jimmy Dale has no interest in repenting. Can I do anything by praying to God and asking God to forgive him? Not a chance. Could Jesus, by praying, even Jesus Christ praying to God, could he get God to forgive the people that were stoning him unless those people did what they needed to do personally? No. Could Stephen have done anything by the, his prayer to God to cause God to forgive the people that stoned him to death? They were going to have to make the changes in their own life and repent. The same thing happens here with the Apostle Paul. 
So what does this mean? What's it all about? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 is a beautiful chapter on love. And in verse 5 it says, does not take account of wrongs committed or wrongs done. One of the things as we start learning about the love and learning how to kind of have the kind of love that Jesus Christ had and that Christians in the first century, including the Apostle Paul, had was love means do not take account of every wrong that has been done to you in your life. <clears throat> have you known people that seemed like they drugged this big old giant chain with them everywhere they went? And if you had any time to, have to talk to them or any time to be around them, they could give you a long, they could spend the rest of the night telling you every person that had done them wrong and every person that they needed, that they ought to get back at. I thought it's interesting. I was studying this subject and did a lesson on it a number of years back. In 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2. David is on his deathbed. King David is on his deathbed. Now, what kind of a man was David? He's known as a man after God's own heart. That's a good thing. But what did he want to do more than anything in the whole world? Build the temple. Build the temple. That's what he wanted more than anything in the world. Was he allowed to do that? No. Why not? He, was, he had bloody hands. He had killed too many people. He had killed mass quantities of people. On his deathbed, you can read this in 2 Kings chapter 2. He's sitting there with Solomon, his son. He's going to be the next king. And he's going over a long list of people that he didn't get around to killing before he died. And he wanted Solomon to make certain that Solomon did kill all of those people pretty shortly. Because he didn't get around to it. He ran out of time. Now, that may have been okay for kings, but I'm going to suggest to you this. If we learn what this principle is, and I'm just saying it's encapsulated in this little verse right here. What this says to me is, if I can learn how to unload a chain and say, this person did me wrong, and I, I've spent enough, enough brain cells I've burned enough brain cells, I've cried enough, I've, I've wallowed in my bed enough hours, and I'm done with it. And what I want to do is turn this over to God. And I'll let God figure out how he wants to deal with all these people that may have done me wrong. I'm going to suggest to you that's exactly what this happened. This was a purging of conscience. This was appropriating forgiveness in the heart of Jesus and in the heart of Stephen and in the heart of the Apostle Paul where they didn't want to take that with them out of this life. How much better could we all sleep if we learned this principle? Now Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12 and verse 17 do not repay evil for evil to anyone. Anybody know what the next verse sentence is? Leave room for the wrath of God. Anybody think that you could sleep better and live longer and your life be more pleasant if we could figure out how to drop some of these chains that we're dragging and just <coughs> leave them alone? And we appropriate forgiveness in our hearts, just like these three men did, because I don't know when my last hour is. Owen talked about that a little while ago. These, the first two here knew exactly. They were, they were staring it in the face. The verse right before, this verse right here, Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Do you think he knew that his time, he was about to meet his maker? He didn't want to take this with him. It's something that we should work on not taking with us either. we got a song that Brother Jeffrey's going to lead us in that will be our song of encouragement for the evening. If we can help you in any way, let it be known as we stand together and sing. At the cross, Christ will meet you there.
Two things I want to say before we have the closing prayer. The lesson Sunday morning, uh, if you want to look ahead at this story, hopefully maybe you've already heard it. The story in Acts chapter 10 where Peter was asleep on a man's house and he saw a vision. And maybe you know what that vision is. <clears throat> Took three times for this sheet of unclean animals to come down and the voice from heaven says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, I can't kill these animals. They're, un they're unclean. Anybody know what the voice said next? God made them clean. They're clean. So he, he later learns that God was making a point to him. And the point was, you have had in the back of your mind, maybe in the front of your mind for a long, long time, that every single human being that's not Jewish people are unclean, and I'm telling you that that's wrong. And Peter says, I figured it out. And then he goes to the house of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, and he says to the Roman soldier, Cornelius, I have figured out that God shows no partiality toward people. And then in Galatians chapter 2, about 15 to 17 years later, Peter was still having the exact same problem that he had before. And the question I'm going to ask you is, how could that possibly be? A man who was the, the first or second apostle picked by Jesus Christ, he, he, he preached the first gospel sermon, he had a problem. And God busted that problem out of him but 15 years later, he had the same problem. And I'm going to say to you Sunday morning, that's the story of Rick Moore. And that's your story, too. We're going to talk about first nature and second nature. So if you want to read Galatians 2 and Acts 10, the second thing I will tell you is, uh, Brother David Smitherman signed a contract on a house this morning in Columbia Lakes. And so um, most of you know he has been preaching for 52 years, most of that in Corpus Christi. He uh, resigned from that job about a month ago, and so he's coming down here, and so, Lord willing, he will be worshiping with us in three or four weeks, something like that. So we'll be dismissed. Shall we pray? Our most gracious and heavenly and merciful God, we come before you today singing praise and, and worship. We thank you, God, for this wonderful day. Be with the sick, the traveling, the working. Be with Brother Rick as he heals. May we take this lesson that we've learned from Brother Rick and Owen and see if we can use it in our everyday lives. Help us to become better Christians, grow as a Christian, to teach others of God's Word. Be with us as we read our Bibles and study that Word. Lord, be with each and every one of us as we go forward from our, with our everyday lives. Guide us towards the light of the righteous. Guard us from our everyday temptations. Direct us in the way of the Lord. In God's hands, we put all of our worries, our cares, and our troubles. In God's wisdom, we put our goals, our paths, and our direction. In God's love, we put all of our lives. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. Amen. Amen.